Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Promoting Protective Caregiving Roles for Parents with Co-Occurring Disorders webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. Wednesday, February 26, 2014. I would now like to turn the conference over to Amanda hopping -Win. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the first webinar of our 2014 series, Promoting Protective Caregiving Roles for Parents with Co-Occurring Disorders. I'm Amanda hopping -Win, Associate Director here at the National Abandoned Infants Assistance Resource Center, located at the University of California at Berkeley. We're funded by Health and Human Services Children's Bureau, and our mission is really to enhance the quality of social and health services delivered to children and families affected by substance abuse and or HIV by providing quality training, information, and resources to the professionals who work directly with these families. Today's webinar will be presented by Kathleen Shaka. Ms. Shaka is a forerunner in the development of treatment methods, program development, and comprehensive services for mental illness, drug addiction, and alcoholism. Her programs have been replicated across the country. She's a national consultant, lecturer, workshop leader, and a former director of the MIDA training site for program and staff development, New York State Office of Mental Health. She has authored articles, book chapters, and training videos, integrated treatment for MIDA, included in the Library of Congress. Her work has been reviewed by Time Magazine, and she participated with a panel of experts in developing the consensus report SAMHSA's Best Practice Guidelines for Co-Occurring psych Psychiatric and Substance Use Disorders. As was mentioned previously, there, the participants are in a listen-only mode. We will have some time for Q&A in the middle of the presentation and at the end. If at any point during the webinar you have questions, feel free to chat them to me, Amanda hopping Win, in the bottom left-hand portion of your screen. And now I'd like to turn the call over to Ms. Shaka. Kathleen, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Amanda. I want to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, and thank you for joining us. Before I begin with the content, I, I just want to say that I've been familiar with the Abandoned Infants Resource Center for many, many years, and they are the experts, as those of you I, I imagine that are affiliated with them, in the work around parenting, child care, uh, for people who have co-occurring disorders. And I am very, very grateful for all of the work that they do. I want to thank Amanda hopping Wen, Ellen Lindsay, and Jean Peterzak, who is the director for all of the work they put into my particular webinar, and I'm sure the others as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to move into the content of this uh, presentation. Okay, I'm going to begin with the profiles of co-occurring disorders and some of the symptoms that we normally find in the different profiles and the related symptoms. Uh, there are two broad sweeps of profiles. One is mental illness, chemical abuse, and addiction, which generally denotes people who have severe, persistent mental illness and substance abuse or addiction. An example would be schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and they may also have trauma or not, HIV or not. Uh, in these clients, the mental illness is freestanding from substance abuse but co-occurring with alcohol or drug abuse or dependence. This client usually participates <clears throat> in the mental health system. Then there is another profile uh, with people who have chemical abuse and addiction and mental illness to a lesser degree. Uh, here you have people with co-occurring personality disorders, uh, emotional disorders, etc. Here you might have a person with borderline personality and substance abuse. This client usually participates in the substance abuse system. And again, trauma of varying degrees is prevalent across all of these profiles and HIV. Now, the second profile can also present with acute symptoms that are likened to severe mental illness, but these symptoms are substance-induced. 
This is very common where the person will be using substance, withdrawing from it, and the chemical imbalances can create hallucinations, psychosis, paranoia, uh, but they are not severely mentally ill. The symptoms are due to intoxication or withdrawal. This client sometimes crosses over from the substance abuse system into the mental health system, usually initially for crisis care, and then they may begin to prefer or become engaged in the mental health system. Now, I have links throughout this presentation. This one goes to the dual diagnosis fact sheet for those of you who want to go further into this topic area. Now, trauma is a major issue among all substance abuses, whether they have co-occurring mental illness or not. Incest is a high-risk factor in the development of alcoholism and substance use. Clinical studies report that 30 to 90 percent of women and 30 to 45 percent of men in substance abuse treatment, not those that we haven't seen yet, have a history of sexual abuse, and this includes people with severe mental illness. The substance abuse is noted to begin for survivors of trauma as a coping strategy, and then it begins to worsen existing problems because now the person also usually has an addiction in addition to the trauma. This is an example of the self-medication hypothesis. Many people view co-occurring disorders in general as self-medication, but that is not true. Many people have freestanding co-occurring disorders and they're not medicating the other, and, uh, but this is an example of that. The literature for children, adolescents, and adults indicates high correlation between symptoms of trauma and substance abuse. Trauma and the other kinds of uh, background information and problems like that can interfere with substance abuse recovery. For example, whereas <clears throat> depressed and anxious moods go into remission for other people during sobriety, for victims of abuse, depression and anxiety become worse when they're sober. Therefore, the client experiences more emotional pain during sobriety. This leads to re relapse, which may be accompanied by desperation, and the client may become defiant and rather than try to be sober again, just not try at all. This really argues for integrated mental health and substance abuse treatment because if we're only treating the substance abuse, we could end up with a scenario like this. The person's in remission and their other symptoms are glaring and flaring and we're not addressing it. <clears throat> Traumatic experience affects beliefs about safety and undue assumptions of trust. So people who have experienced trauma are on pretty shaky ground in life. Uh, adults and children who have PTSD are at higher risk for substance abuse, depression, and suicide. However, PTSD is not the most prevalent uh, reaction or response or mental illness associated with trauma. Well, another one is dissociation. Dissociation involves psychologically separating from the body during a traumatic event. Uh, studies that use hypnosis with people who have been traumatized have shown that the client may go back to the actual event and then begin to report that now they are watching this happen to them. They're no longer experiencing it. That is the defense of dissociation. Now that could be temporary or it could become a chronic way that people remain defended after that event. The most severe dissociative disorder is the dissociative identity disorder, which is very rare. Now, there is some hope. Uh, one study by the SAMHSA that studied women with co-occurring uh, mental illness, substance disorders, and trauma showed significant improvement if counseling addressed all three of their service needs in an integrated way. They had two groups of women, one who had integrated care and another who had discrete treatment for each disorder separately, and the ones with integrated care far surpassed uh, their improvement. 
The women's symptoms were also improved when they participated in the planning, implementation, and delivery of their own integrated services, and this cost just the same as whether they did or not. Now, I want to note here that the person participating in this area of their treatment is parallel to client-centered treatment, and I'm going to review client-centered treatment in a way that promotes deepening the client's involvement and improved parental care. I also want to point out that this study cited the tremendous suffering for women as a result of misdiagnosis, mistreatment, and the absence of integrated care. Now looking at these uh, illnesses from a developmental perspective, uh, one of the prevalent areas is developmental arrest. This is where the person's emotional life is lagging behind their chronological age, and there could be huge differences for some people. Uh, this can begin at infancy with an unresponsive environment that's void of mirroring. This is Kohut's theory of narcissism and borderline personality disorders. The defenses that result include the fragmentation of the self, and becoming defended with the different narcissistic traits, borderline traits, etc. cetera. Uh, childhood trauma in itself is a cause of developmental arrest. Substance use, the client may begin using substances at 13, 14. At such point, their own emotional growth ceases and they begin to cope with substances instead. Peter Bloss, who I recommend if you work with adolescents, has studied the adolescent progression uh, for many, many years, and I have a reference and the resource for him. And he coined the term called prolonged adolescence. Here he views that many of us see adults who are still developmentally arrested in their adolescent stages, many younger than that, who have not made life's choices, et cetera, and, and moved into the adult realm. Within this context, uh, people are not prepared to separate in the normal way in which we grow away from our caregiver, we grow into independent lives. And in fact, many times the client might split away just to feel independent, go into the drug subculture or somewhere else, but they remain forever independent unless this is resolved in therapy or some other way. As far as individuation goes, individuation is oppressed. Oppressed does not uh, proceed. Identity does not form. The elements of self are not evolving. So the person may begin to take on the identity of their behavior. They're a drug addict. They're a prostitute. They're a schizophrenic versus who they genuinely are. And certainly someone who is developmentally arrested in this way uh, lacks emotional maturity. One of the reasons that I feel this is very, very important for us to keep in the foreground is because many clients that we deem as choosing to remain addicted, choosing not to take care of their kids, choosing not to work, etc., are rather not emotionally mature enough to pursue any of these. Sometimes not emotionally mature enough to pursue sitting in an office, having an intimate conversation with us. Uh, and we need to consider that as part of the client's overall profile. From a physiological perspective, <clears throat> there are genetic predispositions to alcoholism and some other drugs, perhaps, for some people. Not everyone is genetically predisposed. Children and adults are at risk for genetic predispositions to mental illness and substance abuse. Clients maintain tolerance levels in physical addiction. So, for example, a smoker is not going to smoke one cigarette one day and three packs the next. Now they, they have a tolerance that requires three packs, and they're going to smoke three packs every day. And that begins to constitute that addiction. People need more and more or level off at a certain amount to keep themselves comfortable. Substances uh, from a physiological perspective may alter brain chemistry, make withdrawal very difficult. Uh, they may exacerbate symptoms of mental illness, and also clients develop very strong psychological dependencies on substances they can't 
talk to people or, you know, socialize without, you know, a certain amount of substances in their system. So to sum up in physiology, in many cases the client is no longer in control of the use of the substance, and the substance may serve as a medication to ward off withdrawal symptoms. So a client may have a relapse and, and blame it on an argument that they had with their husband or their boyfriend, and we might go along into examining that situation when the reality is that the person's uh, response to withdrawal became so severe that they went and used the drugs in order to feel better. The disinhibiting properties of alcohol can result in exacerbation of underlying psychopathology. So, for example, and suicide. You know, uh, a social drinker might have a few drinks and feel comfortable to dance around and joke around, whereas a person who has underlying thoughts of killing themselves may disinhibit themselves enough to actually go ahead and make the attempt. One-third of suicide attempts are noted to be alcohol-related. Alcohol is also correlated to interpersonal violence in the family. So when some biological factors are genetic, HIV is transmitted, it's another biological factor, chemical imbalances could be inherent in the person or exacerbated by substances. All right, so given the symptomatology uh, that we'll look about at, you know, as we move along, uh, and that's important for you to consider when addressing people with co-occurring illnesses. Uh, we will now look at, you know, the challenges for parents who have this array of disorders. Some that are very important and that really need to be a part of the information that we present to people is overcoming personal internalized stigma and low self-esteem in relationship to mental illness and substance abuse overcoming inhibitions involving public stigma in relationship to mental illness and substance abuse, moral judgments, people's belief of inadequacy around a mentally ill person or a substance abuser, engaging in treatment to stabilize and overcome mental illness, trauma, and all of these co-occurring symptoms, growing emotionally, individuating, developing one's identity from the arrested development that they may begin. Building strength, skills, and confidence in their parenting and other responsible roles. Being responsible for safe pregnancies, birth control, child care. These are major challenges. Navigating, navigating the social service system and keeping a financially secure environment. Major for people. Assessing one's limitation and accepting support and assistance without self-disdain. This is very important. This goes back to the shame, blame, guilt uh, that keeps people from accessing help. Some of the risk factors for the children of parents who have co-occurring disorders include facing the same public stigma regarding their families and themselves, genetic predispositions, to mental illness, substance use, inherent emotional developmental arrest, lacking of mother-child attachment, mirroring, nurturing. The next webinar, number two, will address this in a lot of depth. Predispositions due to being born addicted, the mother's substance abuse, HIV positive, developmental differences, risk of trauma from direct abuse or witnessing abuse or violence, potential poverty and homelessness, neglect or lack of supervision, an unstable environment, frequent moving, changing schools, foster care, responsibilities that are not age appropriate, and uncertain parenting due to their parents' symptoms, taking medication, substance use, leaving this child to navigate an uncertain environment. A long time ago, I developed an evaluation tool for looking at high-risk children for substance abuse. And uh, I'm not going to go over this whole list. You have time to do that. But certainly, there were actually more on my list. But the more that the client has or the child has, the more at risk they are. So, for example, the family history of substance abuse is one. 
uh, lacking coping skills is another. Uh, a disturbed family life with violence is another. So we really have to look at prevention and how we might address that very concretely in our care. So some interventions for clients with co-occurring disorders and their children include, and must include, let me put it that way, regardless of what method or model we use to work with our clients, we want to convey acceptance, dispel and counter stigma, shame, blame, guilt, inferences of morality. Interventions must be empathic and non-judgmental. The client is the center of importance. We need to elicit and evoke their side of everything, every decision, every behavior, etc. The real properties of mental illness and substance disorders physiological and psychological must be presented to clients in a way that engages their thoughts, perceptions, feelings, and experiences and elicits their responses. It is understanding this information that alleviates the shame, blame, and guilt. I'm not responsible for being born with a chemical imbalance that I didn't, had nothing to do with. And here is another link for a book chapter that goes into a lot of this information in much detail. In essence, providers must acquire the skill of actively listening to people, following their thoughts and experiences, and responding with empathy, known as empathic reflective listening. Engagement of a client into a safe environment is absolutely essential. I just want to go briefly over a couple of interventions for dissociation and developmental arrest since I mentioned these earlier. For dissociation, we want to focus the client's attention on the physical aspects of the self a, on a regular basis. We need to foster the reintegration of the client's physical and psychological self. So examples are focusing the client's attention to their hygiene, their grooming, their health care, nutrition, safe sex, etc. Focusing the co-occurring parent's attention on these areas for their children so that the physical self and the physical lives of their children become an integral focus in their lives. One way we can do this that's interesting is to invite our own staff who have skills in these areas, or outside people to be speakers in our groups or program events, nurses, fitness trainers, nutritionists, etc. to talk. These groups are very interesting when we bring an outsider in, etc. I do this all the time. I have done. Interventions for developmental arrest really come out of self-psychology, Hans Kohut work. Now, he believed that the client who had very little or no mirroring needs to be mirrored in order for the elements of their self to become reintegrated and back to wholeness. So we want to mirror people's selves, elements of their selves, and individual interaction, groups, even casual discussion. This is not something that would be superficial, like what a pretty pair of shoes, etc. Uh, it goes to values, creativity, traits. So rather than what a pretty blouse, one might say, you know, you always put your colors together so nicely when you dress. Or you really care about what other, whether or not others are treated fairly. Or you're very helpful to the others. Now in groups, this can really become phenomenal because groups begin to form consensus around various traits where people say, oh, he always makes us laugh and he always helps us and we don't want him to leave. And so there becomes a consensus around who people are. Identities become validated from a group perspective. Now, the next area that I want to talk about, which I believe is pervasive, not only in our behavioral health care, but in physical health care, is accepting the client's readiness 
and level to accept our interventions or participate in behavior change. A mismatch of client readiness and our intervention might be something like the client doesn't agree they have a substance abuse problem, they got there through the courts or somehow, and our intervention is an action plan for abstinence. Uh, this results in a disconnect versus engagement with the client. It results in a discordant relationship. The client might be withdrawing, arguing, etc. And now we begin to label people as non-compliant or resistant. This results in our programs, our providers extending resources around non-compliance and resistance uh, to no avail. It perpetuates the lack of care and it's all a result of misinterpretation. The client must be at the readiness stage to, set, to accept an intervention that we provide. So that learning to practice client-centered communication skills can result in client engagement, genuine dialogue, and the potential for client movement. Now, I'm going to introduce you to just a, a brief overview of the case. We're going to call him Frank. And as I go through some of the client-centered skills and promoting parenting uh, skills, I'm going to move back and forth into some examples of Frank. These are <clears throat> actually coming from uh, sessions that I've observed in his early treatment. So Frank is a 33-year-old male. He has a clinical profile of alcoholism, anger management, including intimate partner violence, trauma, and depressed affect. His childhood includes physical abuse, harsh parenting, and an absentee father. He's married. He has three children. He's employed, but his job is in jeopardy. Next. All right, so what I'd like to go over now are the stages of change. This is the work of Prochaska and Di Clemente. Uh, from their point of view, a, a client's behavior as it's related to the change process is defined by their level of readiness to change. And as far as they see and study, people change incrementally. They don't go from not thinking they have a problem to doing everything they can about it. All right, so the first stage in their model is pre-contemplation. This is a client who truly does not believe that whatever it is that we see as a problem or other people see as a problem is actually a problem for them. So uh, it's not the resistant, feigner, getting over guy. It's the person who does not think this is a problem at all. When we're working with people in the pre-contemplation stage, what we need to do is try to facilitate their recognition of some negatives around this. Generally, they think it's fine. You know, I use this drug, but I don't use it. I'm not addicted or whatever they think about it. It's usually okay. Usually the place that we can start is how did this client get to us? Apparently someone else must think it's a problem. So that may be an inroad. You know, how they got here, if the court sent them or somehow social services or child, children's services, however they got to us, why do the, are the people thinking this way, et cetera. For the most part, a client in pre-contemplation is going to be unhappy about the fact that other people think they have a problem and they're trying to make them do something about it. That would be identified as a peripheral uh, net, you know, recognition of a negative effect of the behavior. It's not the behavior itself but it's the things that are happening around that behavior that are negative in the client's life. So if the client comes up with a couple of those, you know, the wife is nagging, the, the court sent them in, you know, they could go to jail, their children could be taken away, et cetera. These are negatives. This would move the client out of pre-contemplation into contemplation where the client now sees the positive or okay elements and the negative associations. And in this stage, what the therapist and counselor wants to do is to deepen that change talk, as we call it, and evoke and elicit more client change talk. But here I, I want to impress, 
not what we think or why we think the client should think this is negative, but we want to elicit and evoke what the client sees as negative about it, what the client sees as problematic about it, because that's going to be what the client would base their decision on and what's going to propel their motivation to change. Now, if the work goes as we intended or hoped for it, the client will resolve the ambivalence in the contemplation stage, which is, I like it and I have problems and I don't know what to do, I'm stuck, and reach a point where there are so many more negatives that the client is at the point of saying, you know, I can no longer justify this behavior, there's just too much of a loss here. And that moves them to preparation. Preparation is I'm ready to do something about this, what do I do? That would entail, first of all, asking the client from a collaborative perspective what they think could help, what they think might work, and then asking permission to offer our suggestions. Uh, from all of these different suggestions, we would come up with what could actually happen, what the client actually thinks they could do. If you're familiar with functional analysis, this might be a place where we might, we might ask the client to do that so that we could identify <clears throat> um, triggers that the client needs to develop coping skills around. And also in preparation, when we've come up with our menu of options, which could be five or six different things the client's going to do, we want to implement them incrementally in a way that the client can be successful. So the client knows they could call their brother-in-law and not go out with the drug-using friend. That's what we're going to do first. Uh, and as the client now begins to take actions from the plan and move into the action stage and begin changing the behavior or adding the behavior that we're looking to add, then they're moving into the action stage. Now, I just want to reiterate that in the preparation stage, the plan is not written in stone. It could always be changed. It's an endless well of how we could address this issue so that the client could come back the next day and say, you know, the support group we put in there, I really don't think I want to do that. We don't want to put anything in there that the client will fail at. We only want to include things in the plan that can have a potential for success. Uh, so if the client completes the action phase, they're in remission, they're doing a new behavior, et cetera, now we come up with a maintenance plan to provide supports around maintaining that. That's also known as a relapse prevention plan. Now the That's client may permanently exit the wheel, they never go back to the behavior again, or they relapse. If they relapse, that means something went wrong with the maintenance plan. It is not considered treatment failure. There are no punitive consequences. The response is this happens to a lot of people. Let's see what happened in the maintenance, what went wrong. It could be that something new came into the client's life that we didn't account for, et cetera. And we Kathleen, I'm wondering if I can stop you for just a second. Sure. You, you mentioned briefly functional analysis, yes. and, and a few participants are wondering if you can just very briefly describe what that is or where they can learn more about that. Okay, what that is is a, um, it's a tool. There are many different kinds. The one that I use is client-centered because it asks the client about, for example, what would be a time when you would be mo most likely to drink alcohol, let's say? And the client might say, well, if I'm home alone and, you know, nobody's there, I might go out to the bar. So we're going to elicit high trigger times from the client. And then we're going to elicit what the benefits are to that client. Well, you know, it makes me socialize and be with people, et cetera. So we come up with two categories. One is, you know, what would make the client actually go and do that behavior, the high triggers, and the other is what does the client benefit from doing it. Then we're going to go back and look at each trigger. Let's take the one sitting home alone. Does the client have, believe they have any other option than to go out drinking if they're home alone? So we're going to come up with a list, say, of maybe ten reasons, ten triggers or five triggers. You want to try to exhaust that. 
And the ones in which the client has no options, that's the only thing they could do. If I slap my wife around, I got to get out of there. I got to get high, you know, to keep from hurting anybody any further. There's nothing else I can do but use drugs. These are uh, high trigger areas in which the client needs to develop and evolve coping skills to address differently. That's where perhaps like cognitive behavioral therapy might enter into this. Uh, however, what the, what the functional analysis does, say we're not cognitive therapists, is to highlight for the individual from their own words and the one that I use, uh, what are the triggers that they absolutely, you know, would not be able to uh, control. Now, you, you have to consider here, you have a client in the preparation stage. You would not be doing this in contemplation or pre-contemplation. Pre this person wants to change, and given that the client wants to change, this is very important information for this client. And when we don't do it, then we leave the client as a sitting duck. We might go through their whole treatment into maintenance, and that client may run into a bunch of old friends or slap his wife and then run out and use drugs again, having no foresight, no coping plan in place. Okay, so that's essentially what it is. It's, a, it's a, an assessment of triggers and it's an assessment of the most dam damning triggers. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. All right, so I'm going to wind this up now. So essentially, many practitioners say their clients come in in pre-contemplation or contemplation and that they are prepared to intervene with the client with an action plan. The agency requires it, for example. I don't want to get stuck here, but I, I feel this is worth exp uh, just uh, adding to. If an agency requires that the client must go to three groups, must see the counselor, et cetera, we need to separate that out and let the client know that if they want to participate with us because the court sent them or whatever, there's nothing that we can do about this mandated involvement. But we understand the client's readiness, that the client really doesn't see this as a problem. And as far as our work is concerned, as a, as a therapist, I would want the client to know, I really want to understand from you what this is all about for you what you think about it, what you want to do about it, if anything. That's how I would like our work to proceed. And I hope everybody followed that. Uh, so that if we have the client in pre-contemplation and contemplation, and we're not saying any of that, and we're presenting this action plan, and the client must do that, then without the client's agreement in any way, we either have to coerce them or bribe them. If we coerce them, say, we're taking your children away unless you do these treatments. The parent may go do the treatments, and when the children are back, the client will go back to the behavior because they never decided to change. And that's what the contemplation stage does. It facilitates the exploration of that behavior so there's an intrinsic decision made by the client to make the change. All right, so the stages of change, I'm sorry, I wanted to move over to Frank before I go further with that. Frank begins his first session in pre-contemplation. When the therapist asks him how he could help him, Frank states he had to come because of some problems. And the therapist reflects back, there are some problems you've been having and someone has made you come here. And Frank says, yeah, which indicates that he's not there voluntarily. He does not view himself as having a problem. The problem with Frank is that he, and how he got there, is that he hit his wife. He was arrested and mandated into treatment. During the first session, Frank actually moves to early contemplation. He offers some peripheral change talk. Okay, so the stages of change view motivation as a state of readiness to move through the stages and it eliminates all negative labels. Why is Frank behaving that way? 
because he's in pre-contemplation. That's why. Uh, it revolutionizes the way we chart progress. Successful change is incremental, not just one global measure. And if we increment the, uh, if we chart increments, we can also con complement the client. Now, I remember when you came in and you didn't see any problems at all. Now you can see how this is affecting your family, your job. The progress notes would indicate the client's stage of readiness for each of the areas. And, and co-occurring disorders, we have clients at different levels of readiness to change uh, the way they address different symptoms and behaviors. So we have a complex plan here. So where is the client with drinking at this stage? Where is the client with uh, domestic violence at this stage? Where are they in proper parenting at this stage? Uh, so that we need to chart where the client is, and when we have more than one provider working with the client, then they can be consistent. We all know that Frank is in pre-contemplation, moved a little bit into contemplation with his ability to address this issue. I'm going to move on now to client-centered treatment, which is the basic work and prevalent work of Carl Rogers. And one of the main interventions that motivational interviewing has adapted that really was something he focused on in research over many years is empathic reflective listening. As a clinician in this field for a long time, I have observed this to be one of the most potent skills that deepen client communication, their self-awareness, and their motivation. Part of client-centered work is collaboration throughout. We're always evoking and listening the client side, not just sitting around waiting to see if they have something to say. The communication skills referred to as ORs have been adapted by motivational interviewing. They include reflective listening, and they round out the communication in a way that makes it very comfortable. Acceptance as part of the spirit of motivational interviewing and Rogers' work can relate back to Rogers' unconditional positive regard, where even he himself has stated that he has found this very challenging with some clients. But in essence, every human being is entitled to be cared for, understood, supported, regardless of what they have ever done. And one is to respect autonomy. In the end, the client is going to decide what it is they will or will not do. Uh, and if you want to study these further, there's a video clip that you can access. Now, Frank's first session was open with empathic, reflective listening. The therapist followed him, stayed close to him with empathic reflections throughout the entire engagement process. After a very short time, Frank's participation became conversational rather than defended. And as the topic gets clarified, then the therapist begins to evoke the client side. <clears throat> All right, so getting back to the auras, I just want to cover those for you. And the ORs include open questions. An open question is one that cannot be answered yes or no. If you could say, yeah, no, it's closed. Uh, open would be, what would you like to discuss today? What's been going on for you? What was your week like? Closed, have you been taking your medication? Did you go to group therapy? Those are closed. A stands for affirming. Active listening, reflective positive elements, as that is to reflect positive elements of the client's demeanor. It's almost like mirroring, but doesn't, may not go as deep, but it's also not superficial. So we're reflecting the client's demeanor, their behavior, their efforts, their goals. You know, what I'm hearing is that it's really important to you to be a good parent. You know, you've made a number of efforts to quit using drugs. It seems you haven't found the way that works for you. Now, some hypothetical comments by Frank in his situation might be, I'm not treating my children the right way. I don't know what to do. This is a wide opening, 
<laughs> for our usual interventions, which is to give advice, ask questions, give advice, evaluate, etc. Rather than give advice, one would reflect the positive elements of the statement, which is, this client cares about his parenting. So we might reflect, it's important to you to be a good parent and you're looking for answers. Reflective listening is the R in ORs. It's always in the form of a statement. The words you and your bring you to a statement. You're not happy the way things are with the way things are now. You want to be a good parent, but you're having a hard time quitting this drug habit. You don't like coming here. You're wondering what others think about you as a parent. With Frank, the opening engagement included a few simple reflections where we don't add or change meaning, but mostly complex reflections. Simple would be, Frank says, had to come, and the, and the uh, someone you know made him, and the uh, therapist responds without changing meaning. Someone has made you come here. A complex reflection is as Frank's talking about. His wife wants to go to school. He doesn't think she needs to. The therapist reflects, you're okay with the way things are now. Your wife wants more schooling, and that's not okay with you. That would be complex. Okay, so reflective listening includes simple reflections and complex reflections. And simple, there's no change in meaning. You could <clears throat> just repeat what the person said, uh, which we very rarely do. The only time we would simply repeat is if the client is agitated, upset, angry. Uh, the client says, I don't like coming here. And so you don't like coming here. Otherwise, you would not repeat. You would more likely rephrase. This is not a place where you like to be. Reflective listening includes complex reflections. Here's where you add more meaning or feeling. Coming here makes you feel inadequate, like you can't take care of yourself. You're feeling frustrated with the side effects of your medication. Now, getting back to Frank, his presentation problem is a presenting problem, is a cognitive problem. My wife wants to go back to school. I don't think she needs to, so we argue. With continual, complex, empathic reflections, Frank is led to feel more comfortable, more safe, and to deepen his responses. He proceeds to responding a little bit later on. She might go back to school and decide she don't want nothing no more. She don't want no family. The therapist adds more meaning and deepens Frank's statement. She might go back to school and decide she doesn't want to be with you any longer, and she's real important to you. Frank says, yeah. He then reverts back to the cognitive piece. She's smart enough already, and the therapist reverts back with him because we do not push up against resistance. That's as far as Frank wants to go in that line of discussion, and we respect it, and we go back with him. All right, so in reflect, levels of reflective listening, the levels of a reflecting feeling is the deepest form, the emotional dimension through feeling statements. Complex reflections must outnumber simple ones to reach proficiency in this practice. Empathic reflective listening, the utmost purpose of a reflection is to convey to the client that you understand what and why they think, feel, perceive a certain way. This could take more than one reflection until the client says, yeah, that's right, that's what I meant. To really gain the skill in empathic reflective listening, one must be fully present. And, and essentially, we generally are. People are talking to us. We can tell they're getting a little sad now as they talk about a certain topic or they're getting nervous, et cetera. We need to try to fully uh, include everything we're experiencing around the client's communication and be there in it with them and reflect back what we hear, feel, and see.
Okay, now there's a double-sided reflection, which is a very important in this work. Here's where you have pros and cons, the client with the two-sided ambivalence. You know, on the one hand, you want to be a good parent. On the other hand, you can't quit the drugs. Discrepancy. It seems like you took more drugs in the past, but now when you take a look at it, you're using more drugs now. Goals versus behavior. You wanted to finish school and get a job, yet you're still hanging out and not changing. And then there's the metaphor where we don't use any of the client's words at all. It's as though you're the lonely soldier out there on the battlefield and no one cares about this but you. I don't know about your work, but I've had many clients who come and say, oh, I'm the only one that takes care of it. Nobody really cared about him. They leave him all alone. And, you know, and this is how I came up with this metaphor, which matches that dialogue. Now, with Frank, the pros and cons were used in a later session where we began to talk about his drinking. In the first session, he said the police asked him if he had been drinking, using drugs. He said, no, man, he hadn't been doing it. Uh, but he does talk about the fact that he does drink in the pre-contemplation way. So the pros and cons would somewhat naturally go into a conversation asking Frank what he likes about drinking, you know, what kind of purposes it serves in his life. And clients are often surprised to hear that you're even interested in that. And he began to tell us what he liked, his fun with his friends, and on and on and on. We go into the con side in a natural conversational way. And so on the other side of it, you know, what are some of the not-so-good things? On that side, Frank identified putting his job in jeopardy. He can't get up in the morning. Having blackouts. His friends have told him that he's run around the street without clothes on. He doesn't remember. He physically hits other people when under the influence, which he actually told the therapist about, etc. So we elicited three very important uh, negatives uh, by using the pros and cons. What you want to be careful is, is that you don't really highlight a lot of the pros because you don't want to reinforce what they call sustained talk. All right, so now the S and uh, ORs is summarizing. Summary statements can be used to link together material uh, that, was, that has been discussed at other times beside the session you're in. Summaries have two functions. One are interim summaries. That's when you're in the session. You're not ending it. You can reinforce what was said. The client gives you change. So say, you know what, I want to stop right here. Let me go over what you said. And now you're saying that, you know, you really don't like the fact that uh, you're late for work, your boss keeps calling you in, et cetera. We reinforce the change talk. Uh, we can use interim summaries to slow down the client's talking if they're going on so quickly that we can't reflect things. Let me stop you here. I don't want to skip over what you said. Determine if the topic is to be continued. Let's stop here, go over it. Is there more you want to talk about, the fact that she might leave you? Or is there something else you want to talk about, et cetera? At the end of a session, the methodology is that we always summarize the session in a collaborative way. So a sample lead might be, our time is running out. I'd like to pull together what you've said so far. Let me know if I miss anything important, if I got anything wrong. You always must reinforce change talk in the summaries. If you have a plan, you want to reinforce that. Get the client's feedback. Uh, and a shorter version of your summary can be used to open the next session if you want to bring that information for, forward. For example, one might say, All right, so when we left off the last time, you said you were concerned that your children saw you hit your wife. And then start with an open question. What would you like to talk about today? Now, I'd like to talk about Frank regarding this information. During the first session, Frank expresses change talk. When talking about his arrest for domestic violence, he states, the police said, if it happens again, I could go to jail. When the therapist asks how he feels about hitting his wife when he states <clears throat> that he hit her, Frank says, 
it did bother me, you know, because the kids saw. Now, these statements are reflected in the summary. One would definitely put both of these uh, statements in the summary. But I want to point out what I mentioned before, that this is peripheral change talk. The therapist actually asked him how he felt about the behavior of hitting his wife, and he never referred to hitting her. He referred to the issue that the children saw him, that the police threatened him, etc. So he never identifies the actual target behavior in his change talk. Uh, Amanda, did you want to? Uh... Yeah, I think now would be a good time to break okay. for some questions. Okay. If you, if any participants have a question, please feel free to chat that in on the lower left-hand portion of your screen. One question that, that we currently have is from Joanna Strait. She's wondering how the stages of change theory suggests supporting clients who remain stuck in a stage, like for instance, remaining stuck in the pre-contemplation stage. Right, well, I think that when one can assess that the client isn't pre-contemplation, then we, we really want to intervene with the client in a way uh, that helps them to identify, facilitates the identification of some negatives around that. Uh, and that's really where we need to continue our work. We also want to keep the client engaged. And, you know, there are ways in which we could add more meaning to what a client says. You know, drinking is not that bad. You know, I'm not as bad as the others. So one might reflect back and say, so you do recognize that some other people could, you know, get into real problem drinking. So, you know, you really want to pick up cues and information and reflect in a way uh, which is uh, assisting the client to look at other points of view. At the same time, if you're, if you're with a new client, like with Frank, we don't want to start that from the first two words that come out of their mouth. We want to just really follow along, and we'll reflect back so other people think it's a problem, the court sent you here, but you don't think so. You know, and we're not going to use any kind of a strategy during the engagement process, none whatsoever. We just want to stay with the client, follow them, listen to their ideas, reflect them, etc. But as far as moving the client beyond pre-contemplation, one would then begin to listen intently for anything negative that the client might have to say, or picking up anything peripherally negative, uh, and help the client to you know, look further into that and to perhaps deepen it. And we also have strategies to evoke change talk, which would be just one, of, there are many of them, but one simple example is evocative questions. So the person, well, I don't care about it. My wife is the one. And so I'm going to say, is there anything at all that concerns you about this? Or, you know, uh, what actually does concern your wife? And, and do, you, you know, uh, do you see that as a concern? You know, uh, what is the worst thing you can see that could happen if you don't make a change, which has nothing to do with whether I think it's a problem or not, but my whole environment is engaged? So we would just have to say, and then there are people who may not respond. I mean, this is not, none of this work is ever a magic bullet. Uh, people who just are not doing this and they're not going to do it, and the best that we can do is to keep the door open. But another thing I want to point out is emphasizing personal choice and control. Because when, often when clients say, I'm not doing any of this, I know they could make me come here, force me, whatever, Rather than taking the bait and getting defensive, you know, or pushed away or whatever, the practitioner could affirm that and say, you know, you're absolutely right about this. It's going to be up to you. None of us could make you change. Nobody could make you do it. It's going to be your decision whether or not you want to change your, the way that your family lives together or change the way, you know, this drinking is affecting your life with the courts, et cetera. It's really going to be your choice. We're not going to be able to make you do it. That is a very important intervention uh, because it's the reality, and it really puts the client in the position of holding the reins. You know, I'm, I'm 
I'm going to paraphrase a bit because I'm I'm getting several questions that are along the same the same vein. But okay. the participants are are wondering, and you spoke to this very briefly, but but what you do when there are timelines imposed by outside parties, like um, parents who are working to uh, get their children back from foster care, and they have a certain amount of time given to them, or the children will be, you know, um, placed for adoption. And, and right. they seem stuck. You know, how, how do you help them there? Or, there, or you work in an agency that um, generally only works with a client for eight sessions, or insurance is only paying for this much. Right. You know, what then? Well, you know, these questions are indicating to me that it's being perceived that this style of intervention takes longer than others. So first of all, I want to clear that up. It's not a magic bullet, but Frank went from my wife wants to go to school, I don't think she needs to, so we argue, to she might go back to school and not want no family, and about seven minutes into the first session. So it's, it's really a much more direct channel. So I think, again, there are two parts to our work in many situations. One is we need to honor the agency rules and, you know, where we are within the, our own agencies that we work, for example, if we're in corrections or whatever, that we have no control over and be very clear about that to the client. And then we need to open up channels of communication in which we invite genuine dialogue regardless of what it is between ourselves and the client. Now, within that framework, one really needs to reiterate to the person that they have this much time to go into these actions and that you understand that they're really not agreeing with what they're being accused of or seeing this as the problem. So now you have two tracks here. And the one is the client, if they really hear it and feel that their children could be lost and they have a certain amount of time, one would attempt to assist them to move into the action plan that's being prescribed while simultaneously respecting that the client may not agree with it and how they're experiencing this participation from the point of view of not agreeing with it and also facilitating their own exploration of what they see as the problem as we would with anyone else in the contemplation stage. Is that is that does that clear that up? I think it does. You know, we have about where we have where insurance is not going to pay us to, you know, bring people out of precon. I mean, this is a dilemma in our in our field because it's more wasteful not to engage the pre-contemplator than to treat them as someone who's ready when they're not, because we can go through all the motions. The client may recycle through these treatments over and over again or may never get well, uh, whereas if we took the proper approach, we may end up with some movement. It may only be movement through three stages, but we've still moved. Clients have still moved, uh, whereas we, and that's what I was talking about earlier, where we're only going for the big global change. But if that is a court mandate or has heavy consequences, then we need to convey that to the client from an honest perspective and, that, and tell them where we can be useful and, you know, open the gates for freedom and, you know, exploration and where we have no power, no ability to change things. Great. So we have about 26 minutes left, and I want to make sure that you have enough time to get through the rest of your slides. But I also want to encourage participants to continue writing in your questions if you have any, and we will have a little bit more time at the end for Q&A. And any questions that we aren't able to answer, we will respond to, we'll have Kathleen respond to in writing, and we'll email those out after the event. So Kathleen, okay. back to you. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm up here now on uh, slide 28, and there are four processes engaged in group treatment and in individual sessions. One is engagement. That's the first process. We ask open questions, and we follow actively, reflect with empathy, 
We do not evaluate, assess, strategize, focus prematurely. This might go on maybe for five minutes, two minutes. It should really happen in every session, even beyond the first session. We sit down, how are you doing? Follow along and then move into the focus of what it is we're going to be talking about, which is the second process. And then once we have focused in on the theme or the target behavior, for example, in a group, we would set the theme with the group if we didn't have a pre-planned group. All right, so today we're going to talk about, you know, cocaine addiction or whatever, or, you know, or how uh, to communicate with our children more effectively, whatever that theme is for that day. Now, in our individual sessions, the individual might discuss, we might say, well, you know, what would you like to talk about today? We may also have things that we need to talk about. The pressure is on. The client needs to fill these requirements. Time is running out. So we might say one thing that I felt was important, and then we would collaborate together and come up with what we're going to focus in on. Maybe it's more than one thing, but we'd reach an agreement. Now, in Frank's situation, Engagement went on empathically until it was comfortable, conversational, and then the focus became on topic one. The wife wanted to go back to school, Frank didn't want her to, and the therapist evoked and followed and explored that situation with him. The third process is evoking. Once we have the focus on the target behavior, the, whatever it is, the theme in the group, the topic. In the group, for example, we want to provide psychoeducation so that clients could explore the information from their own point of view. Clients are always critics, never students of information. They want, we want to know what they think, how do they feel, do they agree, what's their experience with this, et cetera. Clients interact with the information, and that's what reflective listening does. If I say, so, you know, she's real important to you, you're worried she might leave you, I have to think about that. I have to relate that to what I said previously and what I really meant to say. So I'm interacting with the reflection. Psychoeducation and reflective listening have been supported by neurobiological research. It's called neural coupling when the client interacts with the information and it results in real communication and behavior change. And I've referenced that study in this uh, slide. Planning is the fourth process. We may or may not get to planning in a particular session. If we do, it needs to be collaborative. Okay, so this week, if anything makes you angry, you're going to step outside, Count to 20, call your friend, whatever the plan is, et cetera. Uh, planning an individual group sessions as well. Uh, when we want to see if the client's ready to plan or make a move, sometimes what we want to do is summarize the change talk that we've picked up from this client so far. All right, you know what I've been hearing? One thing, you know, that you could lose your job, your children saw you hit her, uh, you know, you could go to jail, et cetera. Now that we have the change, you know, what needs to happen next? You know, where do you see this going from here? And that's called an open-ended key question where the client might say, well, I don't know, I'm not going to stop drinking. You know, or they might say, I don't know, you know, I really have to consider doing something about this. And you can tell whether or not the client is ready to move. Now, in Frank's case, the focus was started out with the, uh, the conflict between him and his wife, but then it moved into a deeper element of that topic, which was domestic violence. So now the evoking began to focus around this deeper topic. What if she, he left her, you know, et cetera, uh, until Frank backed off. He indicated he's not going any further down the fear of abandonment path, and the therapist needs to follow that, because otherwise you're pushing up against resistance, and the client will leave you. The client no longer wants to talk about that. You're still talking about it, and essentially the session is over. You must always be moving together, engaging that you are moving together. So the therapist, in this case, he went back to the first topic. She's smart enough already, doesn't need any more school. 
But this line of uh, discussion with further evocation led Frank to reveal that he got pushed to the limit by this nagging and he hit her. And so we got further, actually, even by reverting back to the cognitive element. And we had no plan in session one. There was no plan. All right, now, engaging clients around themes of parental responsibility include themes like, first of all, you, I, I teach theme-sensitive interactional group leading, which is very well detailed in the article that I have on this slide. Uh, so a group theme always includes an active verb, exploring, learning, finding, uh, determining. This is what we're going to be doing, exploring relationships. Themes should begin as benign, not threatening, establish a comfort level of trust, allow clients to go deeper into the theme as they feel comfortable. Uh, so in a theme like this, one would discuss any relationship they want to the positive, negatives. As the, as the discussion deepens, the provider goes past, uh, to past experiences. You know, say the client doesn't like the way they uh, behave toward their child, et cetera. And the therapist may want to see if they can relate the client's past to this behavior. Has anyone ever spoken to you that way? You know, is that the way your parents were? Uh, and to begin to make that connection. As themes deepen, if discussion of parent-child relationships don't emerge, then we want to include that as part of this theme. Well, let's talk about our relationships to our children. How about if we set that theme for next time, et cetera? Now, and for a pre-contemplation client like Frank, even though he's been traumatized and abused, beginning with a more benign theme like exploring uh, relationships is much better to engage him because he has no perception of being traumatized. He's not likely to go to a trauma focus group. The research finding for people like Frank, co-occurring fathers who have substance abuse and violent behavior, shows that many of them have personal abuse histories, but they don't relate it to their own parenting. Okay, so now we want to engage clients around more themes of parental responsibility, uh, focus on the client's concerns about their children's health and safety, listen for their concerns, reflect their concerns, deepen, ask evocative questions. What are the perceived risks? The group thing could very well be similar to our topic, protecting my children and keeping them safe. One could go into sub-themes and theme sounded work. One might say, all right, I'd like everyone to think about two things that you do to keep your children safe. And then everyone could discuss that. And then I'd like you to think about two things that you'd like to be better at that would make your children more safe. So one could sub-theme so people get further into the theme and then what they're going to be talking about. Parental responsibility, who is responsible? What are the solutions? A theme like defining my role as a parent. What am I expecting of myself here? Uh, exploring group themes that address raising healthy children. So we would include psychoeducational materials that detail healthy relationships, nutrition, age-appropriate behaviors. Group themes, I think this one goes into a positive direction. Discovering what I like about my child and my children exploring what makes my children feel safe, communicating with my children more effectively. And here again, we can use psychoeducation, we could subfocus. Now, in individual sessions and in groups, we want to evoke the client's values. For example, Frank's change talk concern was his children saw him hit his wife. This really disturbed him. What is the value here? The value is that, as Frank's value, children should not see their parents hit one another. So his behavior goes against his own values. This is a very strong motivator for behavior change.
Change talk is a, one of the main focuses of motivational interviewing, and we need to focus it around parental responsibility. Uh, and here you can see a video clip that discusses this in more detail. We want to reinforce any change talk the client gives us. I wish I could take care of better care of my children. I'd like my symptoms to be more stable. We respond with reflections and explore more deeply. One way is to ask for elaboration. Tell me more about that. Reinforce during the session and in the summary. Evoke change talk. One strategy I talked about before, evocative questions. What concerns you most about this? How do you think your children are affected? In Frank's case, again, it bothered him, uh, and a, a reflection might be, you're very concerned that your children saw you hit your wife and the way that might affect them. The goal is to elicit high amounts of change talk and low levels of sustained talk. Sustained talk is the status quo. The client, things are okay, he really doesn't get that violent. We want to deepen the client change talk, for example, client says, I have to change this or I'll go back to jail. What are the client's deeper motivational concerns? So we ask for elaboration. What would your life be like if you went back to jail? The client, I'd be away from everyone, my family. And you might reflect, you value your freedom and it's important for you to be with your family. Ask for more elaboration. You want to go deeper into that concern. Tell me more about that. The strength of change talk goes from weak to strong. Commitment talk correlates to actual behavior change. So we want to move it and strengthen it. Client says, I'm really going to work on getting the right medication now. That's commitment talk. Commitment talk in Frank's case might be, I will never allow my children to see me hit my wife or anyone else again. This would lead to a plan followed by an action. We want to engage clients and adolescents, their children and groups with themes about change, identifying, reviewing the changes I've made in my life, building on strengths. Change takes a certain amount of perseverance, et cetera, no matter what it is we're changing. And we can review that and see how it would be needed for this new behavior teaching clients and parents and adolescents the stages of change. This teaches the decision, uh, the process of decision making. Change is a process. So you might go in your group, hand out the wheel, give, uh, ask clients to think about anything they'd like to change about themselves. They're never going to have to tell us what it is. And then as you go out, end off with each stage, you say, how many people are in that stage? How many people are in that stage? What does that mean? and then whether or not they're right or wrong. Normalizing ambivalence. Many of us, you know, are appalled. Here's this person in our room, you know, their kids are taken away, their life is falling apart, you know, they're beaten up. You know, how could they not see the problem? How could they be unsure that they want to do something about that? A client-centered counselor will never think that way. Ambivalence is normal. One must reach the ambivalent state to look at the pros and cons to reach a decision. It is not a weakness. We want clients to come in and say, I really don't know what to do about this. I like that drug. I can't live without it. And on the other hand, I have these problems. We want people to tell us that, not to feel ashamed that we'll think they're stupid or, you know, or weak or irresponsible. The stages of change is looking for intrinsic decision-making and lasting change versus coerced change that's not sustained. All right, so we want to encourage clients, their children, to utilize treatment and supportive services. We want to identify supportive services in the community, link parents and children to resources, continuum of care, after care, uh, school, support groups, one way to do that is to invite providers from outside service to speak for our groups. Now the client knows who they're going to see when they go over there. It's a way to ease the transition, the discomfort, the developmental arrest issues. Agencies can integrate supportive educational and therapeutic activities for parents and children as part of their own services or provide referrals to family therapy and services. 
include parent and children activity groups, groups where parents and their children, you know, simply interact together. Um, and providers can be there, observe the children's behavior and address their parents' perceptions, the interactions, etc. The family approach to children, again, for uh, clients and their children. One can conduct group sessions for clients and pre-adolescent and adolescent children of parents who have co-occurring disorders and actually explore themes of safety and trust. Exploring and identifying the supportive relationships in my life uh, addressing high risk factors, all the predispositions and ways to prevent them in groups such as these. Assisting children and parents to identify who could provide support in their lives and who cannot. Who is in their life who may evoke problem behaviors, deter growth and personal development? For example, a violent father. Many times I hear from providers that work with adolescents that the adolescent is doing extremely well in their care, and now they go back to the dysfunctional home and it all falls apart. I don't see any reason why young people cannot understand and know who's in my life that could cause me to you know, have problems and sadness and bad behavior. Who's in my life that could help me so that they know when they go back to the violent father that this is something that could derail them. It's not just sitting ducks like the person without the coping skill. And perhaps we could also evolve a coping skill, including play groups, groups for children and parents and children to participate in just parallel play, just spending time together and experiencing one another. Family sessions with parents, spouses, and partners, build communication, resolve conflicts, assess the family's needs, would include clients, their children, spouses, and special events at our centers, holidays, group activities at the center, etc. We want to model and teach communication skills that could be translated to parent-child communication. Active listening, expressing empathy, acceptance, and respect. Now, I developed a program quite a while ago that uh, offered supports for families and friends of people who have co-occurring disorders, including their children, which were older children, not little children. And that was very successful. Uh, we educated the family members about these illnesses, physiological, about co-occurring disorders, interaction effects, what treatments are available, not to become the therapist, but to learn how to access services. What are the safety issues in the home? Here's where we can learn a lot about what's going on without, you know, from other members perhaps that the family or the client may not even be telling us. And believe me, I, I don't want to scare people, but I have learned a lot of very serious things from family members. And above all, helping the family and the friends and the contacts of people to take care of themselves, to join their own support network so that they could be there in a healthier way for their relatives. And that's where I'm ending off with my uh, presentation, and I'd love to have any questions from anyone. Sure, I have one ready for you. I'm sorry, I just have one more thing that I just want to end off with Frank. And that was in relevance to the children learning who are supportive in their lives and who are not, who could evoke their negative behavior. Like the research shows that adults like Frank have no idea that they're exhibiting all these behaviors that are related to their past and how they were abused. But the groups where we actually educate younger people about identifying who's in their life can perhaps alter that course as adults. Penny. Great. Um, so Sally Borden says, how do you handle it when client reveals information that you feel needs to be re reported to Child Protective Services? For example, you've engaged with a client and she talks about her excessive drinking and you realize that she regularly passes out and is unable to care for or supervise her three-year-old. Do you address this directly with them? And if so, how? 
I believe, as far as I know, and I, and I think that certainly people from your agency know this better than I do, that when you are in a situation like that, that the client needs to be informed of that when they enter into treatment with you, that, that there may be certain things that, you know, that you would be required to report. And then do you uh, let them know that you're making the report? I back from you. I'm, uh, this is what I hear out in the field. So, but if, if that is the case, I believe the client, you know, has the right to know that on some level, how we convey it. Uh, certainly, if we're interacting with the person, we would want them to know that what we're hearing now is that this is a very unsafe situation and to try to get them to uh, agree that this is not safe and to begin to plan with the client around creating a safer environment, having someone else care for the child. I mean, I've had private clients like that where the children were in dangerous situations and, you know, we've talked about it and the child went to live with the grandmother or, you know, because it, the, both the parent and myself identified that this could not uh, continue. Now, if, you, if the client is not coherent enough or agreeable, I mean, for, that would be the first course of action is to try to resolve it with the client. But I think that if we're in an agency where we are required to report these things, on some level, the client would need to know that. So I, I believe that the majority of our participants are, if not all of them, are mandated reporters and are required to report um, child abuse and neglect. Um, yeah. and, and I would imagine that their consent form speaks to that, saying that, you know, that if anything comes out during session or during services that, that they are mandated reporters. I think the question more was asking, do you inform the client that you are making a child abuse report? Right. Well, I, I, think, I think that you have two tracks here. One is that you want to speak to the client's uh, own resources and understanding of the situation you know, and evoke their experience of this being unsafe, you know, and, and their motivation to fixing it. I think two things need to happen, you know, uh, and then if we can get that sort of rolling along, and if it also does require that one needs to report that, but now you're also reporting a solution perhaps, uh, they would be in a better situation. I don't know how much more thoroughly one could uh, address that. I think if you're going to report someone that, uh, you know, it, it's very tenuous. I mean, you don't want them to go and run away or, you know, do something rash as well. Uh, I, I would really try to appeal to the client's um, comprehension about the issue. Uh, but if you have to report it, I would imagine that you have to let the client know. I mean, in a way, it's like a correction officer's job. You know, the client, you have, the, the correction officer has all these things that the client could get in trouble for that they can't do anything about. A very important issue here when people and therapists have this kind of control uh, is that they're very clear about it with the client from the beginning. So one might say, you know, I have to inform you that if this or that happens, I have no choice. Now, how a person handles that authority is really what I think can make a tremendous difference. So, okay, uh, could a correction officer, we have a lot of authoritarian people. All right, we got you now. Now I'm putting you back and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. When, in fact, the correction officer is doing nothing. These are the rules of the person's probation or parole, the rules of, you know, of uh, safety and uh, child care and child guidance. We didn't make them. It's important that the client is informed about all of them because in the end, it's going to be their choice. A good probation officer might say something like, well, it seems like you chose to go back because the client knew very well that that behavior would get them back. You know, so it seems like you were not able to keep this home safe enough for you to keep your child. You following me? 
Absolutely. Not that I'm the authority figure who has now found this out and is going to tell on you. It, it adds a level of personal responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I hate to cut this short. And also, it allows the practitioner to remain, you know, in some ways on the client's side and, and not and not become an authority figure. That That's... I mean, that is a really uncomfortable place to be. If I'm the person who reports and treats, but for the most part, many people have that on different levels. Every agency has rules and regulations. And the therapist, even though they're there to work with you and engage, you know, in a personal way with you, has to, uh, you know, sustain those rules and regulations. Here, they're more serious. It's like the correct, I, I equate it to the correction notes because it's very serious. People's freedom are taken away. Their rights are taken away, et cetera. And that's why they must know this from the beginning. And they must know that the person that they're speaking to cannot change it or fix it, nor do they impose it. So that when we're talking about issues, we have to remind the person, if this gets even a little bit worse, this would, you know, result in a, a reporting, uh, you know, situation. Is that where we want to go? Can we try to stop it sooner, you know? Uh, but Kathleen, the person has no control over whether Kathleen, it Kathleen, it's a very important conversation, and I know that a lot of, of the participants do struggle with this on a day-to-day -day basis, but I want to be respectful of people's time. It is now um, 1131. So okay. I just wanted to thank you for speaking with us today. I want to thank all of the participants on the call. If you happen to have colleagues who would like to listen in, an audio recording and the slides will be on our website within the next 10 days to two weeks. You can check back there. We do greatly value and seriously consider the feedback of everybody participating in our webinars. So you'll see a link for a brief online evaluation form. If you can just take a few minutes to complete that form, it will automatically be sent back to us. We'd like to receive feedback from everyone on the call, so if you're participating in a group, if each member could uh, fill out the, the evaluation, that would be wonderful. This is the first time we've tried broadcasting the audio through the computer and not having a dial-in number, so we want to get your feedback on that. Um, if you've registered for CEUs, you can go to www.aatbs.com and fill out their evaluation. If you haven't registered for CEUs, it's not too late, and you can visit that website um, after the event. For those of you who are interested, we'll be holding a three-day symposium on a similar theme, supporting children of parents affected by co-occurring disorders in Seattle from June 30th to July 2nd of this year. You can see our website, aia.berkeley.edu, to register for the early bird rate, which is due to expire on March 1st. Also, the next webinar in this series, Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up with Mary Dozier, is scheduled for March 18th. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day. It's been great having you all. Thank you.